Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Dave Richards, and I will be leading our webinar session for today. All right. So I'm going to get us kicked off. Um, today, we'll be discussing the engagement life cycle of a product in B2B and, and B2C users. So a little background about myself. Uh, again, as I said, my name is Dave Richards. Um, I started my career in finance and accounting at PricewaterhouseCoopers, and then I transitioned to sales and marketing at Google, <clears throat> also focused on UX consulting for publishers. And then I first moved into product at Bloomreach, which is a B2B software as a service e-commerce platform where I focused on our search, marketing, and analytics products. <clears throat> and then for the last few years, I've been a product growth manager at Facebook with our business partnerships team. Outside of work, there's really only so much you can do during COVID lockdowns. So I resorted to some new projects and you could probably say I've tortured myself attempting to assemble half destroyed jungle gyms or installing attic insulation, attempting to drywall, or even sadly torturing my children, attempting to have them wakeboard with me. Though as frightened as he looks, I can assure you no child was hurt in the process. He left feeling the experience, in his words, was awesome. I wish I could say the same about my other projects. Well, getting things kicked off. So let's discuss the customer engagement cycle. This is what a normal customer engagement cycle looks like. It's very neat. It looks nice. So let's kind of go through a few, uh, one example of what this is. So let's assume we're an e-commerce store that sells recreational equipment. The customer first becomes aware of the e-commerce provider through ads or expressing a need in a Google search and finds them in a result. The customer then considers the e-commerce equipment provider among others as well, then proceeds to purchase the products from the equipment provider, chooses uh, those products are then fulfilled and delivered to the customer the customer then engages with that equipment, looks for assembly instructions, connects with support to resolve issues or returns the product as well. If pleased with that engagement, then the customer shares their experience with about that product and with others, is made aware of other equipment and so on. Looks fairly neat, looks very nice and sequential, but the reality is much different. This is really the path to acquisition. It's complex, it varies by each person, and it doesn't necessarily come from one place to another. So consider when you were to make a significant purchase, like buying a car, you get feedback from your friends, you check current listings for new and used cars, you check your budget, then you proceed to maybe one or many dealerships, negotiate, customize, wait, you get the idea. You'll even see that people have caught on to this complex purchasing experience and have created some purchasing apps to cut down on that buying process, but it still comes at a premium. Really the holy grail of marketing is often called attribution, knowing what marketing channels actually influenced the product acquisition. And there's complex models trying to determine that. The point is all of these channels and touch points matter. And depending on your product, some of these will matter more than others, which is why you need to run experiments to understand which is performing best. But for simplicity, we'll use this flow, which works well enough for understanding consumer and business products. Now, the reason why it's important to understand all these customer touch points as a product manager is that it greatly affects the experience of the consumer, regardless of how well your products are designed or how effectively or efficiently you're solving the consumer's problem. For example, if they see negative reviews, they'll give you less trust. If it takes too long to receive the promised goods or they're damaged, they'll not return as a loyal customer. Though this seems simple enough, engaging customers through this full cycle, it really is neglected. Nearly 88% of marketing budgets go to the top of the funnel or the awareness strategies. <clears throat> most of and most of those people bleed out and newly acquired customers on down to the engagement line. And in fact, only 20% of companies spend their marketing across the entire customer life cycle. So that's taking all them through all these stages and then back around. So if it's being neglected, 
in their marketing strategies, it's often neglected in product development as well. So for any given product you manage, there are several teams across a business who are also working to optimize the experience at that stage. There are also vendors you'll potentially leverage to deliver those solutions, such as a, if you're an e-commerce, a catalog management solution, a point of sale, a point of sale system, um, if you're a physical store location. And there are also external influences that will touch on the customer's experience as well. All of these teams, vendors, external factors that touch the customer will greatly affect the perception and experience of the product. So as a PM, you can't manage all of these touch points. That is what the whole business you're a part of is doing. But you need to understand, first of all, how all those components play into your product experience. Secondly, determine the gaps in the market currently in that engagement life cycle. Three, focus on delivering a solution which leverages your core competencies and addresses industry gaps. And then lastly, if possible, and especially in your long-term strategy, try reducing those dependencies and bring more of those experiences into your product so they can be within your control. And what makes companies very successful comes down to more than just the product interface experience. All successful companies need to be proficient in each of these engagement phases, but the ones who really rise to the top excel above the competition in one or many of these areas and goes beyond just good product development. A few examples of this, Apple has an incredibly strong advocacy and loyalty among its users. It's also very committed to its brand cohesiveness and it is the most recognizable brand on the planet. Even still, they advertise more than most other tech companies. Google's search point of acquisition is when you discover and click on a relevant search result. As we all know, the relevance and speed that they're able to deliver on that is unparalleled. For Amazon, they didn't dominate the e-commerce space for an amazing online shopping experience. It was actually quite dull but they invested heavily in excelling in logistics, achieving a new standard of same day delivery that is really hard to match. For Facebook, we're all familiar with the news feed, which drives continued consumption by optimizing its users, the user generated content in a feed to match your interests. And for someone like Dropbox, they focused on a strong referral program and provided free additional storage for new referrals. So switching gears from B2B, B2C to B2B, understand some of the nuances between these two sectors, but also understand how product management applies in each of these areas. The key nuances to look out for are first, how the needs are defined. So in B2C, there is a lot of noise and the audience doesn't necessarily match their behaviors with their expressed needs, which is why you need to experiment multiple solutions. But for B2B, you can actually get that feedback directly and it's more reliable. So contacting sales teams or communicating directly with those businesses will provide that clarity on what those needs are. Second is identifying and influencing those decision makers. So for B2C, this is much easier as the person making the decision is often the same user who's converting. In B2B, this is definitely more complex. The buyer, is maybe an executive or manager and is likely not engaged in the product at all. Also, the users of the product often represent one or more other roles in a company with their own goals. So you need to take those user parties into account, especially how you can influence the buyer off product as well. Third is your flexibility for feature releases. So for B2C, this, that this audience often responds well to frequent changes and incremental improvements. But in the B2B, the business user team will have become accustomed to the current version of the product and possibly have built internal processes around this. So when releasing a new product version, you should batch features and provide the necessary guidance and training to transition them to these new iterations of the product. Of course, if there's a bug or an issue, those should be resolved immediately. 
Now, a fourth bonus one I'll mention that isn't listed here is also the size and dynamics of the user base you're building for. So in B2C, you'll often be dealing with a very large user base that is moderately engaged with the product and each additional user will provide marginal gain from the other last person. And the product development will likely focus on this large consumer base. Now for B2B, you'll have significant variance in terms of the business size and the impact on the product. Very often, 80% of your business could be coming from like the top 10 enterprise clients. Depending on your business strategy, you may focus on a binary one, which is driving more loyalty with that top 10% and then driving growth with the other 90%. Now let's assess this engagement cycle in the B2B space. Firstly, as I mentioned before, you'll need to consider building for a variety of stakeholders some of which will engage on and off product and the buyers which often make their decisions will be off product. You also will have many other teams which engage with the business outside of your core product development team. That includes sales teams, integration teams, customer support, business marketing, legal, and so on. So you'll need to understand each of these teams goals as well as what the challenges are for those teams in each of these stages. So sales will be focused on driving more business, support on satisfaction, integration on scalability and stability. Now let's go through another example of a business analytics product and its interaction at each of those stages. At the beginning of the cycle, channel marketing and business development teams help drive awareness for your product with potential business users. Sales then completes the acquisition with the decision maker. Then the technical implementation team will service the new business to integrate their infrastructure into your analytics product. At which point the new client can then engage with your analytics product, which may be the first time you as a PM will see the client in this engagement cycle. Now, if you ignored in your product development all the steps before the onboarded to your analytics solution, you will have neglected important factors that will affect their product experience. So for example, it's possible the biz business development and sales teams were selling solutions about your product, which are not accurate or don't even exist, setting up the wrong expectations with the business. Also, the integration requirements for your product might be so complex that it takes several quarters to finally get onboarded, at which point the user team are completely exhausted or disengaged. And then the support team might be dealing with resolving significant bugs and reporting, which is hurting your product credibility. To be a good PM, your job doesn't just start and end with an interface. It needs to understand and influence all parts of the business which touch the customer's engagement. So also like in the example provided, you'll discover there are more dependencies in this cycle, the less you have inside your control or in the sphere of influence of your product. So let's, let's take that last example. It's possible you could provide a live demo, uh, a live demo tool for sales to accurately reflect the product's capabilities a light version potentially to reduce the integration time or a debugging interface for users to use when building reports. One more example, which is related to my current work on the partnerships side of the advertising business was understanding how these, inter how these interactions made a significant difference in our product design. In the digital advertising space, the logical assumption is that most businesses which choose to advertise on publisher sites, namely Google and Facebook, Twitter, will go directly to those sites to advertise. So in other words, if you wanted to buy Google ads, you go to Google's ad product or buying Facebook ads, you go to Facebook's ad product. But upwards to half of all advertising dollars, that's including digital advertising, are channeled through third parties. It's going to be hard to influence the business's advertising decisions on our product interfaces when they will never in fact see it. This other half of the advertising business is going through this audience. 
this visual only shows the top players. There are tens of thousands not included here. The first impression for publishers like Google and Facebook is that they should just provide accessible tools to end marketers and cut through the noise of this third-party exchange. But that demonstrates a lack of understanding of the value these third parties provide for more complex marketing implementations, or if there's a lack of resources for the business to manage the marketing themselves. This shouldn't come to too much of a surprise. Even as a PM, you might white label a third-party solution where building that capability in your product is not part of your core strategy, such as adopting a third-party chatbot for uh, providing support. So in this industry, many businesses would rather focus their resources to their core products or services and leverage a third party and their expertise to deliver their marketing. In our particular case, Facebook was touching many of these partners directly by our relationship management teams, but we hadn't created products and solutions which could programmatically service, support, and incentivize this third-party audience at scale. The solutions were as simple as creating a new interface or online tool for the third parties to log on and view. It required collaborating with engineering, data science, marketing, sales, legal, customer support, business ops, measurement, creative service teams to build a holistic program which could provide scaled education and support for these third parties, measurable performance benchmarks to, it, to access additional resources, and even live events to drive engagement and advocacy. If I was to overlay this engagement cycle for this scenario, you'll see that these stages in the journey all have a middleman that needs to be considered and how best to influence and facilitate those decisions to provide what is needed for the end consumer, or in this case, the advertiser. In order to achieve this, we needed to partner with those cross-functional teams who were subject matter experts in their domain. This is such a critical comp component of being a successful PM. Each of these teams will also have some level of touch points with your audience and their own KPIs as well. Business education focuses on certification, support and response time, marketing on sentiment, each of these operating independently to address specific areas of the engagement cycle, but not working holistically for that same audience. As a PM, you have the opportunity to articulate <clears throat> the audience's need across this entire engagement cycle and what solutions would help us better influence the audience's decisions. But as a PM, you don't actually build anything you also don't get to dictate what those teams do. So in this scenario, as well as in any other B2B or B2C production solution, um, you help the team of executors, be that engineers, marketers, service teams, understand the vision of the holistic customer engagement solution. So if you've done your job right, these supporting teams understand that vision, the business requirements, market needs and constraints, and are empowered to design and deliver the right solution against those criteria. In this, in this specific example, we needed to think of our product as a hybrid of journeys, combining both digital and human interactions, especially in this case, all the decision-making on advertising spend was happening offline. So that challenged us to think about how we could influence that behavior within our products which led us to leverage our data science and business operations team to implement a performance benchmark and an ascending reward system. Or in another case, working with our sales and marketing teams to have key performers featured in case studies or spotlights. In each of these scenarios, the information and tracking was delivered in the product, and then that was disseminated offline within the third party's own businesses. In other cases, third-party account management teams were primarily engaging in our interfaces to discover best practices and also get support. Working with our support and education teams, we surfaced both the collateral they needed in their client interactions, live support, and expert consultations into the same place and in a flow that matched their current work plan. 
though we may not have had all the bells and whistles of other comparative third-party programs, we were surprised to see how well this third-party audience responded for making this engagement cycle as holistic and as accessible as possible. So to wrap it up, I want to bring it all together into how these principles play into becoming a great PM. There are a variety of backgrounds in product management space. As you can see, I came from a finance and marketing, sales, and then product. So some people can become glorified techies, whereas others are all about market and positioning. Then you have some who are just business analysts, um, and then others are consumer consumer centric idea powerhouses. What makes great product managers is they manage to combine all of these traits together. So this includes firstly knowledge. You are the central knowledge expert about your audience and can articulate the market needs and the engagement cycle. You also understand and define business requirements and existing constraints for those execution teams. Secondly, is skill. So the skill to first synthesize complex processes or systems. That includes having an ability to understand how all the touch points connect in a complex user journey. Just like what we discussed, it can get very complex, the whole thing. You help disseminate all that information to make that accessible for the greater team. You also have an ability to provide clarity on what are the key priorities for the business and what are not, what essentially needs to get done and what can get left behind. Your communication needs to be frequent and crisp up and down management chains and laterally to cross-functional and stakeholder teams. And lastly, you have the ability to synthesize all these inputs into a simple and actual strategic plan or sometimes also called a roadmap. Lastly, you need to understand what is your role. As a PM, you often wear many hats. I've written contracts, created one-sheeters, written code, designed interfaces, and even sometimes at Facebook, but that is not the role of the product manager. You are not the executor. You're also not the boss. You are the coach. You're not the player on the team who's creating the customer experience. You bring the guidance and strategy so the team can execute successfully. Like a good coach, you enable the team to maximize their individual and collective potentials by aligning everybody on a product strategy. You have to influence their decisions and get them on board. The best way to do this is to make them part of the solution process. So giving cross-functional teams clear direction on the customer journey, the market signals, the goals we wanna reach, and the constraints to getting there you can harness innovative solutions from those subject matter experts who will be executing against that work. I first came to that realization of a team's potential in my early PM days. I was sharing with our product engineering team a business user's experience and how they were using the data from our product to create an offline visualization that was a core function to their job. With little suggestion on my end on what to build, the engineers quickly prototyped a new feature to replicate that offline experience and in our product. And it actually ended up being the most engaged feature in the product. So understanding where your role starts and ends can multiply your impact and ultimately drive your product success. That's all for this webinar. I wanna thank you for joining me today and learning more about the product engagement lifecycle.